It's the nation's favourite antiques experts. With £200 each. I like, I like, I like. A classic car <laughs> and a gold scar Britain for antiques. The aim? To make the biggest profit at auction, but it's no mean feat. There'll be worthy winners and valiant losers. It's fine. So, will it be the high road to glory? <laughs> A slow road to disaster. Pull out the ignition. This is the Antiques Road Trip. Yeah. It's a kind of magic. It's the last day before school's out, and our overgrown youngsters, Charles Hanson and Natasha Raskin Sharp, are in full end of term at Hogwarts mode. I'll be your Welsh wizard, and you can be my Welsh queen. <laughs> A Welsh wench. <laughs> no, 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 you're not a wench. No, 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 you're far from a wench. I think you're a Welsh queen. <laughs> a spell of good and bad fortune has left our Celtic darling Natasha slightly in the twilight, and she starts today with two hundred and eleven pounds and twelve pence. Bless her. While Charles's magical powers prevailed, leaving him with a wizard two hundred and sixty-eight pounds and fourteen p to spend on this final road trip. Looking rather serious. It's a blue sky here in Wales. The sun is shining. It means one thing. What does it mean? Welsh gold. <laughs> From Girvan on the Firth of Clyde, Natasha and Charles are travelling south down the backbone of England, taking in the sea air before the coast roads of North Wales and wending their way back to Mould. Today, the journey begins in Carnarvon, meandering east to Chester before heading for that final auction in Flintshire. Let's hope the roads are kind to our 1969 Morris Minor. I think for, for the whole week he's been a joy. A joy? Did we have any break? Oh, we had a minor breakdown. Yeah. We had a minor breakdown, but he came back to life. He's looked after you and I, baby. <laughs> <laughs> All right, don't get too familiar. Sorry. <laughs> but just how familiar have our flamboyant auctioneers become as they've hit the road together? You know, people are relying increasingly on dating apps. I think that people should just take a week's road trip together. Exactly. Just be buying antiques. That's one way to find out about person. <laughs> get on the road. You can't get out of the car, can you? You're stuck in the middle of nowhere. And I mean, this landscape, look at the mountains over there. And the sunny Carnarvon is the starting point today for our whistle stop tour of North Wales. Here we are this in Carnarvon. Perfect. Thank you very much. I'm washing water, OK? There we are. About there. This Have will do. a Great day. You too. Thank you very much. And take in the castle, you know, don't be defeated. I'll keep my guard up. <laughs> Look at the castle. Okay. I'll take my inspiration and from there. Go forth with. Bye See you girls. later. Bye. See you. I'll wash the water as well. <laughs> you be careful. Bye. Yes, careful. Now, let bygones be bygones because that's what Natasha's first shop is called. Good morning. Hi, Natasha. Hi, you must be Ian. I am, yeah. Lovely to meet you. Thank you for having me along to your Purple Palace. No problem at all. <laughs> Certainly stands out. How long have you been here? Uh, just a year, almost exactly a year now. Oh, wonderful. So everything is quite fresh. It though. is. You should find something, I hope, yeah. Good. Sniff out those bargains. Here we've got three rolling pins made out of... Glass. And what's so lovely is that if I lift this one off, obviously glass is blown and coming out of the end here would have been a rod, which is hollow. This would have been a lump of molten glass. Through the rod you would have blown and you would have lengthened the glass and shaped it to become the rolling pin. And when it's formed and ready to go, you break it off from the rod, which is why we have this rough mark here, the pontal mark. And where does that come from? Well, only the Latin word for bridge, pont, it just so happens to be the Welsh word too. Oh, I love it. But would it love you back? What have we got in here? Now, this is lovely. Silver plate, not silver, but I think delightful nonetheless. How regularly do we show you silver plated belt buckles? Well, here is the buckle. Look at this lovely daisy motif, buckle that together. But it's surrounded by, complemented by, the entire belt. Look at that, is that not just resplendent? I'll spin it around so you can see the whole thing, how that would set off any plain garment and just turn it into a feminine delight. And it's all about the central buckle 
this daisy here in the middle. Now let's have a look at these marks. We know it's silver plated, EPNS, electroplated nickel silver. We know that it is not solid silver, but what we do know, according to the label, is that it's a 26 inch waist, 30 pounds. Sounds promising. <laughs> Meanwhile, Charles is chuntering through glorious scenery to his first shop of the day. He's headed up the coast to Landudno with its splendid Victorian pier and seaside attractions. Here I come. Here we are. Digby Antiques. <laughs> what a fine day. Hi, it's lovely. Your name is... Hi, it's oh, Graham. Oh, oh, <laughs> sorry, sorry. Who's... <laughs> sorry about that. Crikey me. Dead down, Digby. Oh, sorry, what's your dog's name? Digby. I'm Charles, good to see you. Charles, <laughs> crikey me. Sorry. Sorry about that. He's a good guard dog. So what treasures is he guarding? What I love, almost as we're in Landudna, is almost capturing the charm of what was this great seaside town many years ago. And here you've got a bit of history of Landudno, these various figures, and that lovely old fashionable beach. And look, the postmark on that card is for 1927. And there's a motor car, like we are today, on the road trip. Nostalgia. Happy days, eh? Because the sun's shining, I'm feeling all quite art deco -y. I'm feeling quite colourful today. And this, again, to me, having had a wonderful drive with Natasha through some gorgeous Welsh countryside, the flowers are out, a really picturesque art deco plaque, which this is, with this thunderous, almost waterfall or river moulded onto this porcelain. And this is retailed and made in Hanley in Staffordshire, in the Potteries, and it's marked as a trading term, falconware. I almost think, looking at this porcelain bracket here, mounted on, was made for it to hang on a ledge like that. Look at that, isn't that clever? This is 1930, 1935, and it's just quite a decorative lot to take to auction, and it could be yours for only £15. But will it be yours, Charles? Back in Carnarvon, Natasha is still attracted by the lure of silver. So what have we got in here? We've got some spoons. And here we've got a pair of, guess what? Ladies' curling tongs. Aren't these so cool? Well. I can't remember if Charles already bought a pair of these or not on the trip. Yes, he did, and he made a small profit. And look at the basic design, exactly the same as curling tongs today. You just heat them up, pop them on, and then you twist. I would hold for a minute, in fact, my lady, my lady would be holding them for a minute. Let that take and then reveal a perfect ringlet. Oh. Yes, but they need to be hot. The date mark, which is somewhere on here, lowercase a, is for 1900. Oh. <laughs> they are actually 30 pounds and so is the belt, same price. I wonder if Ian would do a deal on the two because I think it's for the same sort of buyer. Oh, hold on, I'll close the cupboard. And I'll go see Ian. Belt, tongs. If I were to offer you 30 pounds, um. what do you think? How about 40? Oh, I've got to do it. Can we meet in the middle and do oh. 35? I fell right for that one, didn't I? Sure. <laughs> cool. Done. Thank you so much. Almost half price. Very generous. Nifty work. Now, how's Charles getting on? I quite like this jug here. It's so vibrant. And this jug is Mark Charlotte Reed, made by Bursley Ware. It would date to around 1935. Nice pattern number. Love the finish. I, I, I love the tulips and the tube lining, but what really sets it off is this border here, quite geometric, quite aztec -y, and very much of that 1930s, 40s spirit. There's one issue. It's got a hairline crack just running all the way down through the rim on the inside as well, running down there. How much, Graham? Well, I've got 20 on that, but I can do that for 10 if you... Really? Yes. Are you happy with that? Yes. I'll take it for £10. Excellent. 
Now, let's let sleeping dogs lie. Digby. Digby. Oh, no. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Digby. Told you. And the other thing I've seen is just... This plaque over here, Graham. Oh, yes. What's the best on the Falcon wear hanging charger? Well, I've got 15 on that. I can do that for 10. Are you sure? I am positive. And that's your best price? Yes. I'll take both. £20, pounds, job done. Graham, right, there is 20 you. to you or Digby? I, it always pass it past Digby. <laughs> Digby! Come Digby. on, boy. <laughs> there you go. Right. The old dog did well, and so did Charles. Looks a little cavalier, unwrapped. Let's hit the road. Drive carefully, for goodness sake. Westwards over the Menai Strait now to the island of Anglesey and the village of Clanverpool. Yes, that's the short version. The Women's Institute in Britain began here and Natasha is going to talk jam and Jerusalem with Audrey Jones. Good afternoon, hi. Hello, how do you do? I'm Audrey and it's nice to meet you. First though, that place name. The full version, please, Audrey. Well, I'm glad you said that, Audrey, and not me. Or me. <laughs> Back now to 1913, when women were emerging from the shadows to demand equal rights and citizenship, a struggle often met by a patriarchal establishment with fear and strong resistance. Madge what? A founding member of the Canadian WI came to Britain and pursued her vision of creating such an educational and social organisation here. Her efforts at first proved fruitless, but she was tenacious and found an ally. A chap by the name of Nugent Harris, who was head of the Agriculture Society in London, told her to do her best to establish it in Britain. Under the auspices of Harris's government department, Madge Watt continued her rallying cry and finally, in Wales, one of her rousing speeches persuaded the first women willing volunteers into action. And it was then, on the 15th of June 1915, that a decision was taken that the first WI would be here. Originally under government control, it flourished, and by 1919 the WI had grown to 1,405 branches and was a fully independent organisation forging ahead with radical new ideas to improve women's lives. They established a girls' club here for teenagers soon after the WI was established to educate girls about adult life. A lot of them were going into service and, of course, getting married and having a family and no doubt handwork and needlework became a thing but it was a general education if you bear in mind that I'm sure a lot of these young people were even could have been illiterate and then later they established one of the first child's clinics in this very cottage they were on a mission so that people had a better standard of living and uh, Really, it grew. In the hundred years since it was started, the WI has continued to bring women together in a spirit of education and friendship. It has taken up causes from equal pay to the environment, as well as encouraging traditional skills like handicrafts. The WI established markets for rural women to sell their produce, played a huge part in the home front during the Second World War, and WI member Margaret Winteringham became the second female MP in 1921. But what does the organisation mean to women in the 21st century? So it's not old jam in Jerusalem, is it? It's far more than that. It's quite natural that we do look to crafts and cookery, but we also look at music, drama, sports and leisure. So you can see we are very, very diverse. And very skilled by the looks of things, because all of these items were made by WI members, and in fact, some by yourself, Audrey. It's horses for courses. We have other members that concentrate on our aspects of public affairs. We started campaigning as far back as 1918, after the National Federation was set up. 
and we still campaign on public affairs issues today. And if you could sum up the WI with two words, what would they be? You take advantage of the fun and friendship, don't you? Oh, fantastic. Should we go and get a cup of tea and yes. mull over the topics of the day? That would be a jolly good idea. Time to raise a cup to Madge Watt and the first British branch of the Women's Institute. Meanwhile, our man Charles has the car to himself and he's at full throttle. I'm feeling really pumped up. I like a Welsh dragon. I'm going to breathe fire into my last penultimate by day. I can't wait. Charles's next stop is St Asaph a village-sized city with the tiniest ancient cathedral in Britain. Charles has just over £240 still in his pocket and he has a shopping date at Williams Antiques. Hello. Hello. How are you? I'm good. How nice are you? Nice to see you. Charles Hanson, good to see you. And you, Jane. Hi, Jane. Hi. What a lovely shop you've got. Yeah. Your watch lady. Indeed. Your mum is somebody. Catherine Zitter Jones. Any relation? No, no, but you never know. No, exactly. <laughs> anyway. Flatterer. Time to take your eyes off Jane and cast them round the shop. What's this item? Oh, look, there's two. Jane, you know, I, I quite like these. It looks, to all intents and purposes, like Whitby Jet. Mm. It's not, though, is it? No, uh, it's bog oak. Because bog oak is oak that's been lost for almost thousands of years, buried in the ground, is then surfaced uh, through it being extracted, and it creates this material which is quite dense and black, like Whitby Jet. Yes. She's wearing a hat, very elegant, high society, yes. with a feathering peacock plumage. Mm. And here you've almost got someone like Ruth on the other, like Rebecca, in mm. the religious yeah. sense. She is, in fact, Beatrice Cenci, an Italian noblewoman executed in 1599 for the murder of her father and who became the subject of much literary and artistic interest. Mm. My guess is they would date to around 1885. Yes. And, of course, they're black. And, of course, mourning jewellery, very popular under Queen Victoria after Prince Albert died, of course, Indeed. in the 1860s. Uh, mm -hmm. How much of a pair? 55 in the condition, unfortunately, they are in. But... Yeah, they are a bit tired. Mm. They're a bit mournful. What's the death? I think uh, a straight 50. OK. An interesting choice. Does Sir fancy anything else? One more thing I do quite like is this nice bamboo-inspired jardinier mm -hmm. or maybe little pot. Do you like it? I do. It's quite garish, but it's majolica. As a looker, it's got it. I know, it's lovely. And it's a survivor. Isn't it? It is. This has been here 130 years. It's 1870, 1880. It could be Wedgwood, it could be by John Forrester. There was a price, yeah, here's a price tag. There is. How much could it be? That price tag says £25. It could be. <laughs> 15. Really? Yes. £15. OK, I like the pair of bracelets. You said 50 on them. Mm. You couldn't do a bit more. For the two? Yeah. So that would make up to 65, so 60. OK. So that'd be what? The bracelets at 45 and the Majolica Jordan yeah, there, no 15 pounds. Thank I you very much. 60. Thanks ever so much. Diolch and Valiam. Diolch and Valiam. Diolch and Valiam. Diolch and Valiam. Which means... Thank you very much. That's lovely to hear. Say it again to me. Diolch and Valiam. And say so until next time. Thank uh, you, Charles. Dork. Thank you. Take All care. the best. Bye-bye. Bye. Well, that wraps up a very successful first shopping day. Isn't this wonderful, the charm? Can you feel the Welsh charm now, the cow parsley? I think I can. Do you know, I absolutely love Wales. I've, I've got Look at the wind. I know, but I've got no idea where we're going. That's all right. Just go with your heart. OK, Just go with the heart. With heart. Second start to the right oh. and straight on till morning. <laughs> Nighty night. Our Antiques stars are still shining brightly this morning. It's the last shopping day before the final showdown in Mould, and the pressure is on. This is going to a penalty shootout. This is, you know, literally after extra time. We can't tear them apart. Oh, Charles. We've had losses, we've had winnings, and it comes down to only £60. Pounds. 
then there's, ever, there's everything to play for. Oh, absolutely right. Yesterday, Natasha was dazzled by silver, an early 20th century belt and a pair of curling tongs. Pop them on and then you twist. Leaving her 176 pounds and 12 pence. While Charles was enamoured with an Art Deco wall plaque. Look at that, is that clever? A Charlotte Reed jug, a Majolica jardiniere, and two bog oak and porcelain bracelets, leaving him with 188 pounds and 14 p. See, I would, I would compare myself, I suppose, as an Englishman in ball sports. I would be um, <laughs> Wait for it. Wayne Mooney, you know, I... on the edge, about to knock the ball in and take the week. In your Scottish world and ball sports, who's your hero or heroine? Maybe I'm a rugby player. OK. Maybe I'm Gavin Hastings. Oh, really? You're quite tough. <laughs> That's so, a little bit like... <laughs> I mean, let's, let's face it, it's always Gavin against Wayne then. Rooney against Hastings, OK. May the best man really win. Yeah. Or woman, Natasha's dropping Charles at Chester now. See you later. So his last shop will have to wait. Meanwhile, He's going to go free range with creatures great and small at Chester's world famous zoo. You must be Mark. I'm Mark. Welcome to the zoo, Charles. Love to see you. The main man. CEO Mark Pilgrim is proud of the zoo, which opened in the 1930s. The pioneering vision of a man called George Mottershed. Look at these elephants here. I feel so free I could roam with them. But of course, going back to the Victorian times and before, the cage was almost the biggest thing you saw before the animal, is that right? Yeah, absolutely. These elephants are hugely social. You've got mothers and um, grandmothers and sisters and babies. But I mean, of course, in those days, people weren't concerned about how the animal was feeling. It was much more about safety. And so, you know, everything was kept in huge, great iron bar cages for the safety of the public rather than the, uh, the well-being of the animal. George Mottershed had a passion for animals. At his father's nursery, he kept birds and small animals, and as time went on, his collection grew, and he developed his own ideas about how animals should be treated. He loved the animals, and he wanted to set them free in their natural habitat, as near as they could be, but for the public to obviously enjoy. George really didn't want to see animals kept in small, dingy enclosures. He wanted to give them space and freedom and allow them to behave naturally. The Mottershed family moved to Oakfield House in 1930 and built the zoo in its grounds, opening to the public a year later. George was a real innovator. He put great apes behind water. He was the first person, for example, to put big cats behind chain-link fence, you know, something yes. that actually happens all around the world. So he wanted to get rid of the obvious visual barriers and have that feeling of openness and space and linking enclosures together so you had that landscape view. I mean, he was, he was a real visionary, actually. And these days, you know, the, the zoo world is a huge network yes. of experts who talk to each other about the best way of doing it. George had none of that. You know, he had to make it up as he went along, really, in terms of even how to transport a bear safely and how to get it out from the truck into the new enclosure. All those sorts of things would have been very different back then and probably very exciting. Yeah, rather than him than me, though. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Mottershed was a fighter. He was paralysed at the Battle of the Somme and confounded doctors by learning to walk again. And that's the kind of determination he brought to the creation of Chester Zoo. It's like lots of visionary people. People at the time thought that he was slightly mad and it wasn't going to work. But his character saw that through. He was determined that he could make this work and it was the right thing to do for the animals. And now almost every good zoo in the world follows the same kind of principles, but it's all about the animals and their needs. And actually that DNA, if you like, still runs through Chester Zoo today. George Mottershed died in 1978, but today 15,000 animals from 500 different species call his zoo home. Oh, hello. What's that then? You want a tasty snack? And you want Charles Hanson and Keeper Vicky to come and feed them to you, don't you? Hello, meerkats. Hi! They're very cute. Oh, you yeah, almost want to stroke them, but I can't, can I? Almost want to stroke them, yeah, but definitely can't, sorry. No, I can't buy one, can I? My no, no. 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 <laughs> I, I need a little mascot in my car. A <laughs> mascot on my way to Flintshire. Please don't be alarmed if they no. do climb up your leg at all. So no, and, and, and can they sit on my knee at all? Or? Yes, they can come onto your knee if you're comfortable with yeah, it. I think so. Yeah. All aboard <laughs> on the road trip. So they're using you as a platform to look out. Okay. Hello, bird. I think we're looking at Natasha. Oh, hello. Yeah. Hello. Now look, <laughs> Natasha's that way, not this way. They they are so inquisitive, aren't they? And so, yes. Yes. hello, That's come on board. Oops, them, um, sorry. Toddlers with attitude because oh, they're yeah. into absolutely everything. 
Am I right to put some more mealworms yeah, on Yeah, please do. You can put some, yeah, whatever there you like. Are. Yeah, so there we go. Just keep them down there. So I'm afraid no kissing of them either. That's it. Yeah, no, no kissing. kissing of them. No, I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> do you need any help getting out? I'm OK. There you are. Then. There we go. Until next Wonderful. time, meerkats. Thank you ever so much. I feel re-energised. My last shop. Wonder if Natasha's re-energised. She's off over the border into England's Shropshire, heading for Whitchurch Antiques, presided over by owner Penny. This former Baptist church is crammed to the rafters, so good luck, Natasha. Go that lot. We're in Shropshire at the moment, but the auction is in North Wales, Flincher, Mould. I know it's rural. Is it going to be a bunch of farmers in the auction room? Is this what they're looking for? Now, I'm a city girl. All I see when I look at this is Art Nouveau design. But in fact, Braids is the maker. That's what it says in the label. And I see it printed on the neck there. Turf iron slash cutter. A turf iron or a cutter. OK. So I like it. It says it's 1930s. They're not asking the earth for it. They're asking for £20. I'm looking for rustic. It is rustic. It ticks the box. Let's go. Let's get it done. That a girl. Ooh. And is there something else? Do you know, I usually steer clear of East Asian antiques purely because it takes a serious knowledge to know what you're talking about and to try and make profit at auction. But this is something that I can safely say is a rice container. It's a light fruit wood or something that's been stained. But you can see how it's been put together. You can see the different panels of wood. And then it's been bound by brass. How old would it be? I don't know. Late 19th, early 20th century? Probably more early 20th century. But, you know, it has a practical purpose for storing rice. It's done its job and now it could be used to store anything, really, couldn't it? So I don't really know if it screams of rustic whales, but... <laughs> Definitely rustic, so maybe I'll add this to the pile. It could be on a roll all of a sudden. Let's go and find Penny. Hi, Penny. Oh, hello, Natasha. So, I've got mould in the mind okay. because we're going to Flincher. I know we're going to mould. Okay. A mouldy mind, if you will. And I'm obsessed with buying wooden things. Okay. So, a turf cutter. Okay. And wooden rice container, I've okay. seen. Their combined ticket price is £60. Okay. It's 40 on the wooden rice container and it's 20 on the turf cutter. Okay. Oh, if it's not too cheeky, I know it's cheeky. I wonder, would you do me a deal of just 30 for the two? My heart's in my mouth here. Okay. I'm having a breakdown. Um, but well, that's not your problem. Well, normally it's 10%. Oh, right. I think, since it's you, and I know you're up against Charles, uh -huh. and as a very, very special, we could do 30 for the two for you. You wouldn't mind? That's fine. Are you sure? Absolutely fine. Thank you. Half price. Thanks, Penny. <laughs> Meanwhile, Charles is bound for Wrexham and the last shop of the trip, Acorn Antiques and Collectibles. He still has £188 and 14p in his pocket. Hey, presto! It won't work, Charles, it's dead. Definitely. Let's say hello to owner Dennis. Dennis? If I said to you, Dennis, I want something made in history, which would impress Natasha, I know something which came in just the other day. Oh, yeah? Right here. Cast iron wall plaque. I like your style. It's got here Hayden, H-A-Y-D-N. Famous composer. The reason I like this is I suppose if I was born in an age, I'd have been a dandy. And a dandy is quite colourful. Yes. I'm quite colourful. But more than that, a dandy was sophisticated from the age of circa 1770. And this side profile here of this fine man in his frock jacket, his cravat, he just captures elegance. Yes. I believe it to be late 19th, perhaps early 20th century. You know, it's quite abrasive still, which to me suggests not of great age, but it's a good looking object. It's a nice piece. But your best price is? 35. Will that be music to his ears? But hark! The sound of Natasha on her way. I can't even believe that it's not just the final day, this is the final shop. Last chance saloon. Last chance to buy some stuff that will keep me nipping at Charles' heels. Get a move on, then. An actual acorn antiques. <laughs> I wonder if Mrs Overall's in. Sadly not. But there are some comedians in the building. I think Natasha's here. I'd like to take Natasha some flowers. 
Hi, Tosh. Hi, Tosh. Okay? <laughs> How's it going? Okay. I'm okay. What have yeah. you got behind your back? There's some flowers. Oh. <laughs> nice. There you go. You're such a gentleman. You Can you tell the whole thing? Oh, my. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an Sorry, I'll put them back. How's it going? Are you enjoying yourself? I've just arrived. It's the big final posh. Okay. How do you feel? I'm nervous. Good luck. Oh. Until next time. Well, Good luck. To you. Keep pushing. Okay. Set with flowers, eh, Petal? There is in this cabinet a solid silver rose. Your lover might bring you a rose, but how long will it last? Maybe a week if you pop it in water? How long has this lasted? Well, it was Hallmark in 1921, so it's nearly lasted 100 years. You tell me another rose that's done the same, apart from Charles' artificial roses, of course, but this is the real McCoy. It's absolutely gorgeous. Nothing says I love you, but a single rose in solid silver. I'm still waiting for mine, mind you, but my 89 pounds, I might still be waiting for a while. Whatever happened to romance? Meanwhile, Charles is still interested in the Hayden Clark. And your best on this would be... Was it 35, you said? No, I'll do it for 25. Really? All oh, right. 25, OK. Snapped up at £25. <phone rings> Natasha still has £146, 12 pence, but she's looking a wee bit lost. Is this the sign that I've been looking for? I'm wandering around here, panicking. And here is a rudder, as if the shop is trying to tell me, Natasha, you're drifting. And I feel like I'm drifting. And this is quite a cool thing, isn't it? We've got a good bit of what I think is oak. We have nice brass mounts. I think that it's 1920s, 1930s, something like that. It's something that could easily go in Sir's office. It's something that would look good in a sort of a snug, in a pub. It's got a bit of a masculine feel to it. It's got a bit of a masculine price to it as well. Oh, I'm going to go talk to Dennis because I am rudderless and if I take the rudder with me, perhaps he'll feel a bit sorry for me and let me leave with it. Dennis, well, I, I come to you with a metaphor. All right. I, I have a rudder, but I'm feeling a little bit rudderless. Are you? This sort of thing I've never sold at auction before, so I'd be a wee bit cautious about paying the full ticket price, which, as we can see, is 65. Right. So I'm going to be just super cheeky, 30 pounds, but that, I know that's a bit cheeky. 36. 36? Well, every pound counts, Dennis. Of it does. So what about 35? Go on. Oh, OK. Go on. <laughs> Go on. Consider me no longer rudderless. Right. Exactly, that's right. <laughs> Will it be plain sailing from here, though? See you again. Shopping safely stowed away. Journey's end looms. I've enjoyed every minute with you. Oh, Charles. Oh, no, you're, you know, you're a younger whipsnapper. You just <laughs> have a sort of a wonderful new energy in, in just adoring what you do. Well, it's great to be working with one of the best. Get one out. of the oh, best. Hmm. It'll be pistols at dawn tomorrow, though, after some shut-eye. Mould, in the Welsh county of Flintshire, is where the fate of our antiques rivals will be decided today in Dodd's sale room. It is our last auction, <laughs> and I think for that reason, let me show an age on, OK? <laughs> Come on. Oh, that feels good. <laughs> <laughs> good luck, Charles. <laughs> Charles and Natasha quick-stepped from Carnarvon around the coast of North Wales and took a twirl in Chester before swinging round to Mould. The Antiques Emporia of Wales were music <laughs> to Charles's ears, and he spent £105 on five lots. While Natasha heard the siren song of Celtic treasure and spent £100 on her five lots. What do they think of each other's buys? Ah, Natasha's Art Nouveau belt. I think it's really stylish. It's very evocative of the Art Nouveau movement. But the problem is, for £20, who really wears them today? No one. Decorative, but not very practical. Whatever you say, Chief. Now, I'm a bit jealous because I wanted to buy jewellery and couldn't find what I wanted. But, as desperate as I was, I didn't buy these bracelets. These are the saddest bracelets I've ever seen. They don't weigh anything, they have no gravitas, and I think that will translate in the sale. £45, Charles. <laughs> I actually don't know what you were thinking. Prove me wrong. Oh, dear. 
bog standard bracelets, eh? Well, we'll see. But what does our auctioneer today, Anthony Parry, think of their lot? The curling tongs, they have got silver handles. Not a lot of use today, the ladies don't use them. Shall we hope for about £20? The Hayden plaque is 17th century style, but it's probably not as old as me. I'm looking for somebody with the name Hayden, and we might be able to sell it then. What shall we say? 30 to £50. Pounds. But of course, it's the buyers who will call the tune today. Time to take a seat. It's a room full of energy. It's wonderful to see. First up is Charles's Majolica Jardinier. A tenner. Ten pounds I've got. Ten Hold pounds. Tight. Ten. Oh. Ten pounds down here. Twelve. Thank you, sir. Fourteen. A fresh bidder altogether. Fourteen. Only one more Fourteen. Is, is that all it's going to make? All done at fourteen. That's expensive. Oh, oh I don't believe it. That was so close. Mulbarato. In Spanish, very cheap. Mulbarato. Oh, dear, they said boo-hoo to the bamboo and lost you a pound. Mulbarato. Why are you speaking Spanish? Room wheels. Well, yes, you're right. I'm sorry. <laughs> now, will rural Wales fancy Natasha's turf cutter? Fiver I've got. Five pounds. Five. He's got a five. Six. Eight. Ten. Call it a thousand pounds. Twelve. Well done. Fourteen. Well done. Oh, no, 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 no,
Give me a smile. Look at me. Look at me. Charles's last lot now, the cast iron plaque of Haydn. 10. 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 24, 26, 28, 30 pounds, 30, 2, 34, 36, 38, 38. All the 38 pounds then. 38 pounds. The maestro has made him 13 pounds. He played sweet music. And last today, Natasha's silver-handled curling tongs. Ten pounds I've got. Ten pounds. Ten pounds. Oh, it's got twelve be. pounds. Fourteen outside. Sixteen you, inside. You end on a high. Come on. Eighteen. Twenty. Twenty pounds. Well done. Twenty. Twenty-one. Oh yes. Twenty-one. Another pound. Twenty-two. Twenty-three. Twenty-three. <laughs> He can have them. He's got plenty of air, though. <laughs> 23. They still 23. work. <laughs> and we're all done. Finished, then. You're not having another pound? You have ended on a high. I'll take that. that. Well done, our silver darling. And it's the end. We're going to keep in touch, aren't we? <gasps> I hope so. I mean, I've really learned from you, Natasha. You are a lady of history, and I hope you might even... Pen me a letter. Pounds, six, I'll sit there with my six, silver seven, handled eight, curling tongs and my eight, quill eight, oh, and I'll pen you a love letter. Oh, sounds eight, wonderful. Eight, Just one thing, don't give me a dear John. Oh Charles, I wouldn't dream of it. Come on, Charles, let's get out of here. It's the end. It's the end. Sad. Time to count the pennies in the piggies. Natasha started out with £211 and 12p, and after auction costs, she made a loss of £8 and 16 pence and ends up today with £202 and 96 pence. Charles began with £268 and 14 pence, and after sale room fees, he made a loss of £17 and 26 pence. But we declare that he is the winner of this road trip with £250.88 in his piggy. All profits go to children in need. Thank you for the memories, I mean it. It's finished. I know. How are we going to cope without one another? Do you know, I really don't know, because it's been a wonderful week and I'm going to miss you. Oh, Charles, that means a lot. Oh. And we'll miss them too. It was a week of fun. Oh! Afternoon. Folly. <laughs> and fanciful fashions. How do I look? A week of sunshine, shine, <laughs> and wind. <laughs> and we'll meet again on some sunny day. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> we call that tenor? <laughs> Good try. Thumbs up. Thumbs up. Oh. I thought it was time for Good luck. Don't worry. Don't worry. Dinner flash. <laughs> bye bye. Hasty bag.